What's up guys, Tommy Bowyer here from Move Rewind and today I'll be reviewing Doctor Who Series 10. There will be spoilers in this review, so without further ado, let's get into it. Doctor Who Series 10 starred Peter Capaldi as the 12th incarnation of the Doctor and Pearl Mackey as his companion Bill Potts. Matt Lucas and Michelle Gomez also appeared as Nardo and Missy respectively. It is the 6th series to be overseen by showrunner Stephen Moffat and it commenced airing on the 15th of April 2017 and concluded after 12 episodes on the 1st of July 2017. It is also Capaldi's final series in the role of the 12th Doctor. Now there's a lot to talk about with series 10 so now we've got the boring details out of the way, it's time to get on with the review. Series 10 of Doctor Who is an underrated series in my personal opinion. Firstly, Peter Capaldi as the 12th Doctor. He's amazing in it. Um, he is one of the best actors in this entire series. And the 12th Doctor in Series 10 is a good mould between the Series 8 Doctor, that more questionable version of the Doctor, and the Series 9 Doctor, which was the more approachable and likeable version of the 12th Doctor. So Series 10 is a good combination of them. In terms of the Doctor's story arc this series, I love the fact that they use the years he spent on Derillium with River Song and how he is technically a widow in grief. And I think that works really well. The Doctor's main story arc for this series, as I see it, is about redemption. It's the idea that he's trying to deal with the loss of River and he's trying to do good things in her name. So I really like what they do with the Twelfth Doctor. The companion Bill Potts. Bill was a breath of fresh air. Um, so much better than Clara was in series 9 because she's relatable. She's not someone who knows everything. She's technically the Doctor's um, mentee and she fits that role really well. She's a breath of fresh air, she's likeable, she asks loads of questions which makes her very relatable and down to earth. Plus I love the rapport between Bill and the 12th Doctor. They're one of the strongest companion teams because they just I get so much joy just watching them interact with one another. Capaldi and Mackie just bounce off each other really well, so they bring that um, Doctor and Companion relationship to life. Nardo, portrayed by Matt Lucas, and I remember when Nardo was supposed to uh, be in Series 10, everyone was unsure because they thought, oh, you know, Nardo's just a comedic character, he'll get annoying after a while. Well, Matt Lucas proved that he could do serious acting as well. Nardo is brilliant. Not only is he a very funny character, I also like how he's got this seriousness to him as well. He stands up to the 12th Doctor on a number of occasions and says you need to make sure that you're keeping your promises and you maintain your responsibility. So I love um, the relationship between the Doctor and Nardole as well. And they and when Bill's included, they form this great three-person team, which is just a joy to watch on screen. Now, I'd say the main story arc for Series 10 is broken down into two parts. The first part is the mysterious nature of the vault, which the Doctor and Nardo are protecting at university, and we don't really know what it is, but the second half of the series, we learn that this vault is actually Missy, and the Doctor is trying to persuade her to turn her back on her evil ways and become good. This is a great series for Missy in the sense that this is about Missy trying to seek forgiveness and redemption. She wants to be good and Michelle Gomez shows a completely different side to the character in this series. For me, series 10 is a very character driven series and I think that's why I enjoy it so much. It clearly focuses on the Doctor, Bill, Nardole and Missy at its heart and it's great to see them um, all having their moments to reflect on one another. And it's also a series with very strong episodes. Series 10 is a back to basic series. I'd say it's a great jumping on point for new viewers because it's very approachable. They kind of inform you about what Doctor Who as a show is all about. But I think old viewers will appreciate it as well because it does feel like a breath of fresh air. It feels re-energised after they took that gap year. So Series 10, it's a very underrated series and I love it to bits. Now, let's get into the individual episodes. Before we get into the good stuff, we've got to talk about the bad stuff. And the 2016 Christmas special, The Return of Doctor Mysterio, is the worst Christmas special I have ever seen. Now, in perspective, Doctor Who had taken a year break. There had been an entire year since The Husbands of River Song. So you'd, you would expect Doctor Who to come back on its A game, but th they really didn't. Now, The Return of Doctor Mysterio focuses around superheroes. 
it was 2016, you know, superheroes were quite popular. That was the year of Batman vs Superman, Captain America Civil War. So obviously, Moffat decided the gimmick of superheroes might encourage people to watch this special. And it just fails. This special doesn't really feel like Doctor Who. It feels like a knockoff superhero movie. Uh, the Doctor and Nardo especially are sidelined a lot in this special. And they they, they don't really have that much involvement on the outcome. If you took them out of the episode, I, I, do, I feel like it wouldn't have made that much of a difference apart from the guy getting his superhero powers. Now, Grant, who is the superhero, he's likeable enough and his love interest in the form of Lucy, who's a journalist, I mean, they're likeable characters and I can't really fault their performances, but... They're not memorable. They don't really stand out. You know, I, I, I would forget their names after a little while. So, yeah, The Return of Doctor Mysterio, I've never really been a fan of it. I find it quite dull. I find it quite generic. I understand Moffat was trying to do a parody of superhero films, but I just don't think it works that well. Um, plus, I don't like the threat. You have these alien brains that hide in deceased human bodies. Kind of feels like the Slovene, but just kind of repackaged a bit. So yeah, I've never been a fan of the threat. I find their plan quite predictable. So yeah, The Return of Doctor Mysterio was a very disappointing Christmas special. Um, to be honest, it doesn't feel that much like a Christmas special. Yes, it's set at Christmas, but that is about it. So yeah, this was a very disappointing special, um, and it did start raising doubts about Series 10 for me. Fortunately, you know, that, that it was wrong, but... Um, yeah, The Return of Doctor Mysterio, I've never been a fan of this Christmas special. I've always felt the superhero gimmick, while novel at the time, as time goes on, it's just aged quite poorly and it's not a high quality special in any form. The Pilot. As the name suggests, this does feel like a pilot to the show. And to be honest, this is one of those episodes, old fans, it will feel like a breath of fresh air. For new fans, it will feel like a great jumping on point. Because by the end of this episode, you know what the show of Doctor Who is about. This episode introduces a great companion in the form of Bill Potts, Pearl Mackey, was great from the off in this role, perfectly cast. Plus, obviously the clear friendship between Capaldi and Mackie off screen makes the friendship between the Doctor and Bill on screen feel so realistic. You can tell that there is a mutual respect between the two and I love that quickly they established that the Doctor is going to be Bill's mentor throughout the majority of series 10, which I think was a decent thing to do. The pilot really does introduce you to time and space through through the plot you have bill being hunted down by this alien water which has taken the form of heather and it's trying to get bill as um, her passenger so the doctor has to try and outrun this pilot by firstly going to another country and then having to go into space and then having to go to a different time period so it really does show you what Doctor Who is about, it shows you exactly what the TARDIS is, who the Doctor is, and how this show works and operates. So I think it's a great jumping on point for new viewers, um, but also old viewers will really appreciate the fresh atmosphere which this episode creates. Plus, it introduces you to the idea that the Doctor and Nardole have been working at this university for a long time, they're protecting this mysterious vault, and the Doctor gives lectures as, um, as a teacher. Now, whoever came up with the idea of the 12th Doctor delivering lectures deserves a pay rise. Peter Capaldi, he's great at monologues, and I will never tire of listening to his lectures about time and space and how relative it works. It's just amazing. Whoever came up with that idea, well done, because they're fantastic and something which makes this episode stand out from other series premieres. I really enjoyed the pilot. It's a fun episode, and Bill's eventual... The Doctor eventually accepting Bill onto the TARDIS, it feels deserved. After all Bill's gone through in this episode, and even the Doctor by the end of the episode thinking he'll have to wipe Bill's mind in order for her to forget about him because he doesn't want to put anyone else at risk. I mean, that's like nothing we've ever seen before. We've never really seen the Doctor so hesitant to accept a new companion in his life. So it really does feel, once the Doctor eventually says to Bill, you know... Come and join me. It feels 
so deserved. So the pilot, it's a lovely little episode. It feels like a breath of fresh air. It introduces a great companion. Plus, I think it's just a fantastic episode to start a series off with. Smile. Probably the biggest surprise from series 10. I think a lot of people looked at the concept of the emoji bots and just decided, yeah, this is going to be a shit episode. But you know what? It's a fun episode. I mean, it's the second episode of the series. It's Bill's first ad proper adventure with the Doctor. They go to a human colony in the future. And it's just much like the pilot. It's a lot of fun. I love the on-screen relationship between the Doctor and Bill. They just sell that friendship so well. And there are plenty of funny moments with just the two interacting, which is just fantastic. I like that Bill still asks loads of questions. This is something Moffat decided Bill would do throughout the series. And I think it pays off because obviously Bill's human. Humans are going to react in these situations by asking loads of questions. So I just think it makes Bill even more grounded and realistic and also relatable for the viewers who are watching it. Now, the idea of Smile, this human colony where there are emoji bots who kill you if you are anything but happy, is such a great idea. I, it's bizarre, but it would only work in the world of Doctor Who, and I love it. The emoji bots are actually pretty creepy, and I also think the story behind them is interesting, how the emoji bots don't know how to cope with negative emotions. So their first instinct is to remove the person causing those negative emotions. So it's kind of like a program which doesn't understand it's doing anything wrong. It's just trying to do its best. I also think the solution to the episode is not a cop out. Having the doctor have to reset the system um, in order for the emoji bots to forget their core program. I don't think it's a cop-out. I think it works. I think in a more light-hearted second episode, it works even more. I love Smile. I think the things to take away from Smile are the developing relationship between the Doctor and Bill, which is done very, very well. The emoji bots, they'll provide some creep factor for the episode. Plus, I think it's a decent message of how you don't always have to be happy. Sometimes negative emotions are useful and it's important to not try and hide away from them. Thin Ice, the Victorian version of Free Willy. Um, but in all seriousness, I think Thin Ice is a very high quality episode. I love the Victorian Frost Fair theme. Um, the Doctor and Bill fit right into it very easily. I love the costumes they wear in this episode. It fits this Victorian atmosphere they've created, which Doctor Who are very good at doing Victorian themed episodes. And this episode is a great example of that. I also think the plot is pretty good as well. You have this gigantic fish under the frozen lake who takes people, which adds a lot of intensity to the episode, especially as these smaller fish, uh, which you can only see as lights under the frozen lake, follow people around and slowly take them under. So you know as soon as you see those lights that, you know, you're going to have an intense chase scene where the Doctor and Bill have to try and fight for their survival. One thing I love about Thin Ice is we see some of that Series 8 Doctor again, especially when a kid is taken by the fish creature and the Doctor is more interested in studying the creature and saving his sonic screwdriver and he just says, you know what, I, I couldn't do anything, sometimes people die. I think that was a great scene because it showed to Bill that travelling with the Doctor is not always going to be fun. You know, Smile was pretty light-hearted in its atmosphere. Thin Ice is the first time we see the Bill, Bill and the Doctor fall out. You know, we see Bill questioning the Doctor over, have you actually killed someone before? And the Doctor is very cagey about giving an answer. So I think it's great that you see a degree of tension between the Doctor and Companion. You know, Bill questioning who the Doctor actually is, because she doesn't actually know that much about the Doctor. Now, the main villain of Thin Ice is obviously Lord um, Strathclyde, hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, who is basically using this giant fish creature for profit. Yes, he's a pretty stereotypical villain, you know, he doesn't really stand out, but you know what? The actor does a decent job. You hate this guy, which is great, and I especially love when the Doctor punches him for being racist towards Bill. It's just one of those moments, I don't care if it's a bit undoctory, you know, the Doctor doesn't always use violence, but I feel like the 12th Doctor would react in that situation, so I, you know, it was in character, and I can't help but not smile when he punches that guy. 
he's it's great to see this guy get his comeuppance when he's eventually killed by the fish creature a creature he has tortured and kept prisoner for years you know so yeah he's a stereotypical villain but you know what you're glad that he gets his comeuppance in the end which is always a great thing for you know for a villain to have done um i said that this episode is like free willy I mean that by the sense that the Doctor and Bill agree that it's time to release the creature and they eventually release him in the end. So, yeah, I was joking around. But all in all, Thin Ice, I enjoy Thin Ice. I think it embraces the Victorian Frostfair theme very well. It has a very despicable villain. And I like how we see some more of that questionable Doctor again, which we haven't really seen since Series 8. Knock, knock. Very creepy, horror-inspired episode, which is just perfect for the world of Doctor Who. Um, this episode develops a very creepy atmosphere. The house is has a very intimidating design. I love the direction. It's very horror-inspired. Plus the soundtrack. Murray Gold did a very good job um, at creating a very creepy soundtrack, which adds a lot of intensity to the episode. Now, this episode introduces four characters who Bill is hoping to house share with and you've only got 45 minutes to develop these characters and you know what they're actually pretty well developed plus the doctor has some very funny moments in this episode i especially love when he puts on um little mix and he's like oh yeah we're gonna stand up we're gonna stay up and like have a party i just i don't know why there's something about that scene it's just so socially awkward but it's something the doctor would definitely do so there's a lot of charm for this episode um but if we go into the more of the horror aspects, or at least the horror-inspired aspects of this episode, they're done very well. Um, with the people in this episode being picked off one by one, it adds a lot of intensity to trying to find out what's going on. The insect creatures, they're just creepy. I mean, there's something about bugs which is just creepy anyway, but you know what, they're, they're good, they're very scary and you're, you know, you're afraid that you don't want to be picked off by them. I love the idea of this house which slowly consumes people and we don't really know what's going on but obviously we learn that the mysterious landlord character who's a creepy presence throughout this episode the actor does a fantastic job of bringing this character to life we actually learn that the landlord is actually just trying to keep his mother alive and he, the only way his mother is able to be kept alive is with these insect creatures consuming the energy of victims. And it's a very interesting twist because it's just, at the end of the day, a man who is just trying to help his mother. So it actually becomes quite an emotional episode, which I think was good. You know, if you had had the landlord as just this creepy character like the villain in Thin Ice, who eventually gets his comeuppance, I don't think it would have had the same impact as this actually quite sympathetic character who's only trying to do his best for his bum. So it was an interesting twist to use. The only problem I have with Knock Knock is that all of the characters who die in this episode get brought back. One of those everybody lives moments. And I, I don't know why, for me, it takes away from the episode. I would have preferred it if these characters had remained dead because I think it would have added some some more intensity and seriousness to the episode but at the end of the day it is a minus criticism knock knock is a very creepy episode i think it's a fun episode as well and clearly it's inspired by classical horror and it does it very very well oxygen oxygen is a great example of how you can subtly do a political themes doctor who episode and not bash you over the head with it chibnall really should have taken notes i love oxygen the idea of oxygen being it's a massive critique of the capitalist and money orientated system which we have created. The idea that oxygen costs money. So if you want oxygen when you're working on a space station, you need to work for it. It's an idea which, let's face it, could potentially happen. I wouldn't be surprised. And also it adds a lot of intensity to the episode because the Doctor, Bill and Nardle are fighting for their survival because they know they don't have that much oxygen or that much time to really play around. The corpses in suits with these, um, these suits which are hunting down members of the crew, yeah, they're very creepy because obviously they're corpses. They were once living people. So that adds a lot of creepiness to the episode. Plus, I think this episode is a great example of how heroic the Doctor is. I mean, the Doctor is willing to sacrifice his eyesight in order to save Bill, 
which is something which just sums up the Doctor. He's prepared to put anyone else before himself. I also love the Doctor, Bill and Nardole in this episode. I mean, this is the first episode which we see all three of them team up together and they make a solid unit. I love that Nardole is not just a comedic character by this point. He's actually quite a serious character and he keeps informing the Doctor that they have to protect that vault and they could have died. So he needs to stop taking massive risks and remember his responsibilities. So it's a very interesting uh, dynamic they do with Nardo in this episode, which shows he's not just a comedic character, and plus shows that Matt Lucas is a great actor. He's not just a comedy actor, he can do serious stuff as well. I love the plot twist to this episode, or at least the solution to the problem. In the end, the Doctor tricks the system into saying, you know, if we blow this spacecraft up and we all die, that will cost the company money, so you're, you've got to let us live. So it's great how, at the end of the day, the solution to the problem is making the system understand that, you know, actually by killing them, it would cost them money, because at the end of the day, all this system cares about is making money. So you know what? Oxygen... It's a heavily political episode, yes, but I think it deals with it in a subtle and unique way. Plus, I, 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 th I think it's a great example of how you should do politics in Doctor Who. You can't just bash people over the head. You know, you could have just had the Doctor sit there and deliver a 45-minute lecture on how bad capitalism is. It doesn't do that, though. It just suggests that in a society which is so orientated around money this could potentially happen. So Oxygen, it's a fantastic episode and one of the strongest of the series. Extremis, the first part of a three-part story which involves the mysterious monk's invasion of planet Earth. And Extremis is half an interesting concept and half just expedition. Um, the expedition stuff is obviously we find out what was in the vault and it turns out it was Missy who's been imprisoned in the vault and guarded by the Doctor who is hoping to change her attitude and make her good rather than evil. So that's interesting stuff, but it's also stuff which, you know, it has to be told. So, you know, it's, it's just been thrown into this episode for good measure. Now, the interesting stuff in Extremis, I enjoy. I don't know why, I, I like the idea of the Doctor having to team up with the Pope and bishops in order to try and stop a threat, a threat which is obviously not only extraterrestrial, but it also has a religious foundation as well, which is obviously something Doctor Who doesn't do very often, so it's always interesting to see them do something different. I like the idea that the Doctor is blind in this episode. It's not something which is just forgotten in Oxygen, and they kind of make it work. I was concerned having the Doctor blind would, you know, provide problems for the execution of future episodes but they do a decent job with it having him wear his sonic sunglasses so he can at least um, have an outline of what is going on in a room it was an interesting idea so I don't think the idea that the doctor can't see takes away from this episode I also love once again Nardwell in this episode how he's trying to keep the doctor in line and how he's trying to show him that he needs to inform Bill that he can't see and the doctor's like no no I don't want her to feel guilty it's not for Bill to know at all so Extremis it's a very interesting episode obviously the massive plot twist at the end is that it's all a simulation this is just the monks preparing to invade the earth and that is interesting. It's something which hasn't been done before in Doctor Who. And I've heard some people say that actually, as it's a simulation, that takes away from the episode. Now, I don't think it does. Because obviously, you know, the monks, they're very on planning. So obviously you'd run a simulation to see if your job pays off. And if anyone was going to be smart enough to outwit a simulation, it would be the Doctor. So I don't actually think it takes away from the episode. I actually think it's quite a novel idea having the simulation of the Doctor send an email to the real Doctor to say there is an invasion coming. So Extremis, it was a unique episode, which I think introduced the threat of the monks well. The monks, they have a creepy design in this episode. The Pyramid at the End of the World is the best part of the Monk trilogy because it's interesting how the Monks, they're not just going to invade humanity by force. They basically appear in this pyramid which comes out of nowhere, which is just 
it's, it's just one of those Doctor Who concepts which just works. I, I love the idea that this pyramid just appears overnight and everyone's just like on edge about it. And I love that the monks just say to the Doctor and actually humanity as a whole, look, we're not going to invade you, but eventually you will ask for our help and, you know, the sacrifice you have to be prepared to make to that is your free will. And that is interesting because you're constantly wondering what actually is going to happen to make humanity make a deal with the devil in the form of the monks. I love how half of this episode is dedicated to a lab and showing how the workers are making mistakes by one of them being hung over, by one of them forgetting their glasses and eventually it is that potential outbreak which results in them having to save um having humanity have to go to the monks for help. It's a good callback having the Doctor as the president of the world and having him team up with the UN. It's very good when you get Easter eggs like that thrown in that they don't forget aspects of that already exist in this episode. Now, obviously, the pyramid at the end of the world, the reason I think it's the best part of the Monk trilogy, because firstly, it's very enjoyable. Um, you're invested in this episode throughout. You're on the edge of your seat. Plus, I like what it does with the Doctor being blind once again. Obviously, he still hasn't told Bill he's blind. And actually, it looks like the Doctor has outwitted the monks because he's managed to find a way to blow up the lab so that he doesn't have to go to the monks for help. But the downside of that is the Doctor, because he can't see, he can't get out of the room. So in order for, in order for the threat to be defeated, the Doctor would have to sacrifice himself. And it's interesting how Bill, his companion, the most human companion we've had in a long while, has to make the decision that in order for the Doctor to be able to see again and for him to be saved, she has to give up humanity's freedom to the monks. It's very interesting that they went down that route because it's not like a government has done it out of fear. It is a human companion who is just trying to protect her mentor. So it's very interesting how it is Bill who ends up causing the monks to invade Earth. And I love the cliffhanger to this episode, that the monks are now in charge of humanity. It really gets you in fully invested in the third part. The Lie of the Land. It could have been fantastic. It was written by Toby Whitehouse. It could have been a great roundup to an interesting three-parter, but does it fall short? Yes, but I kind of have a soft spot for it, or at least the concept it was going with. I love the idea that the monks have humanity in the palm of their hands. Humanity has surrendered its free will or on Bill, or Bill has on humanity's behalf, and now the monks appear to be gods. They've always been there. They've always been the ones who have helped humanity progress. And it's interesting. It's one of those, if you can control people's minds and emotions and feelings then you have control over them as a whole so I really like how the monks are not trying to run a brutal regime if anything they're just trying to control the minds of humanity which is interesting to see I also love how this episode starts off with the doctor appearing to be on the monk's side giving these broadcastings where he is endorsing the monks and saying humanity should give themselves up to the monk's authority it's interesting having that evil doctor but as the episode goes on i feel like it just starts to fall apart now the first thing is of course the doctor being shot by bill because bill assumes that the doctor is by this point a lost cause so she shoots him and it looks like the doctor's going to regenerate is it a cop out yes it turns out the doctor actually knew what was going on and recruited a secret team in order to fight the monks off now, I, I don't really know why they did this fake regeneration for... Well, actually, I do. It's to boost ratings. You know, we're halfway through the series at this point. Having a supposedly surprised re regeneration, which was heavily marketed um, the week prior, would obviously increase ratings for the episode. But I just... I don't think it makes any narrative sense apart from an attempt to try and boost ratings. So that was a massive letdown for this episode. Saying that, though, I like what they do with Bill how guilty Bill feels because she feels like she has caused this problem. You know, she was the one 
who agreed to the monk's demand. So obviously she's going to feel that guilt. And I love how they show her talking to her deceased mum, or at least imagining that her mum was there to talk to. I think that's something which is very human, which we can all relate to. I mean, I have you know, gone to gravesides before and spoken to people who are obviously not there anymore. But it just gives you someone to talk to. You feel like someone's there. So what Bill was doing with her mum, very human. Now, obviously, the end to this episode is what it gets criticised for because the Doctor's just like, remember your mum, Bill, remember your mum, and then that will show the monks for what they are. Now, I don't exactly have a problem with it. I can understand how a very human emotion could overwhelm the system. And it's interesting how the doctor's intelligence doesn't actually help in this situation. It's just a human's grief over her mum, which actually helps um, overcome the threat. I feel like it could have been played out a little better. I think the idea of having the centre of the monk's command being having this um, transmitter which transmits how fantastic the monks are into the minds of humanity. Obviously, as I said, if you control the minds of humanity, then you have control over their physical forms. So I don't mind the lie of the land. Is it a little messy? Yes. Is it a bit of a letdown for what was an interesting two three parter up till this point? Yes. But do I have a soft spot for it? Yes, I do. I think The Lie of the Land is interesting. It's a very good concept. Toby Whitehouse does his best with what he's given. And I, I think that the actual end of the episode is not that bad. The only problem I have with it is the Doctor's cop-out regeneration, plus the fact that when the monks leave, it's like nothing happened because humanity just forget. So yeah, they could have done a better job with that, I think. Empress of Mars. Empress of Mars is an episode which is okay but it's nothing standout. I like how we learn more about the Ice Warriors culture, especially their Empress is set up as a very uncompromising general who's prepared to do anything for the good of her species. I think it's very interesting having Victorian soldiers on Mars and obviously the first thing Victorian soldiers are going to do is claim Mars for the British Empire because, you know, why not? That's what the Victorians do. They like expanding the British Empire. I think where this episode goes wrong is the stakes don't really feel like they're there. The Victorian soldiers are going to be no match for the Ice Warriors, no matter what they do. Plus, the Victorian soldiers they introduce are not exactly that likeable or that memorable. I mean, the captain is a weasel and you're satisfied to see him killed off. But then the other commander is kind of a, a coward and I, I don't really understand why this episode plays so much emphasis on him being re a redeemable character because I don't really know what he does which is that redeemable in this episode. At the end of the day Empress of Mars it feels a little bit like a filler episode. I mean there's nothing wrong with it you know you I enjoy the battles between the Ice Warriors and the Victorian soldiers like they're not exactly done in a bad way. I just think compared to other episodes in this series, Empress of Mars doesn't really stand out, especially as you're seeing the return of a classic Doctor Who villain again. I feel like you could have done more with the Ice Warriors than they did in this episode, or at least given them a better episode to be in than this. The Eaters of Light. Such a disappointing episode. Um, I remember when this episode was released, everyone was going on about it because it was written by Rona Munro, who was the first classic Doctor Who writer to return to write for the modern series. So everyone was excited and it was it was just boring. The pacing of this episode is very slow. The side characters were introduced to whether they're the Roman soldiers or the the Celts are just not that memorable and don't really stand out in my mind. The highlights of this episode are the Doctor and Nardal. Um, they, they have a lot of comedic moments together, which I think are good. Plus, it's interesting to see Bill by herself and having to use what she's learned from being with the Doctor in order to help the Roman soldiers out. So that's interesting. I think it's always great when you see a companion stand on their own two feet. The creature introduced in this episode the design is not exactly fantastic. I, I like its method of killing, how it sucks light out of beings. Um, that's an interesting idea, but in terms of its design, it's not that great. Plus, I think how it's defeated is pretty anticlimactic. I mean, they just lure it into this void and then it's just gone. And then 
the Celts and Roman soldiers all have to run in and hold it for the rest of eternity. I just, I don't know. There's, there, there's something about this episode which feels like they just didn't really know how to end it. So they just kind of just tried to do their best. So yeah, the Eaters of Life, like a very disappointing episode. Plus, crows speak in this episode. And I don't get it. I, I don't get what that was about. I don't get what it's supposed to mean. It was just a ridiculous concept. Um, although, actually, one saving grace from this episode, it's interesting to see the Doctor finally being able to get through to Missy. Because we see Missy listening to music and saying, you know, why I've seen so many civilizations fall. Why is this getting to me? And the Doctor's like, well, hopefully... It means you're starting to reflect on your life choices and you might start being good. So apart from that one aspect of the episode, the rest of it, pretty forgettable. World Enough and Time. The first part of the two-part finale, well, it has you hooked from the start. As soon as the Doctor comes out of his TARDIS in the snow and it looks like he's about to regenerate, you're on the edge of your seat because you want to know what has happened. World Enough and Time is one of the creepiest Doctor Who episodes I have ever seen and I love it for that. I mean Bill gets shot within the first 10 minutes of this episode so already it's intense. You can feel the stakes. You can understand why the Doctor and Nardo are so desperate to get to Bill and figure out what the hell is going on. The creation of the Mondasian Cybermen in this episode is done so well. It's done to perfection. This is the best Cyberman story of the modern era because you you see the creation of these monsters and it's not out of trying to create the perfect human race it's about survival this is a ship which is slowly being poisoned due to the atmosphere that they've created and they're trying desperately to survive which is exactly what the Cybermen are their main goal is to survive so it's great that this episode actually shows they're not robots they're human beings so this episode does a great job with that. I like how it uses the paces of time. The idea that where Bill is is going a lot faster than where the Doctor and Nardo is. So it feels like a race against time for the Doctor and Nardo to get there. I like what they do with Missy as well. The idea that Missy is trying to lead the team and the Doctor's trying to see if he can trust Missy or not. Because he's still unsure. He sees elements of good in her. But he still doesn't know if she's just playing him along. Plus, obviously, the biggest plot twists <laughs> um, in this series are that Bill gets converted to be a Mondasian Cyberman, which is heartbreaking. I mean, Capaldi's acting, he doesn't even have to say any words, just through his facial expressions. You can tell how devastated and how guilty he feels. And then, obviously, the realisation that this person who had been looking after Bill all this time is actually the master portrayed by the legendary John Sim once again and you know what if that hadn't been spoiled before this episode aired that would have been one of the best plot twists in the history of modern Doctor Who um, but I don't think it takes away from the episode it's still a fantastic plot twist and works very well World Enough and Time is one of those episodes which once it ends you really sit there for a couple of minutes contemplating your existence because it just shows how human the Cybermen are and how just they're just trying to survive they're trying to enable humanity to survive so World Enough and Time it's a very creepy episode it has some shocking uh, plot twists plus it's a great story for the Cybermen the Doctor Falls, one of the most epic and emotional series finales in a very long time. I adore this episode. Peter Capaldi, he is the standout. He is amazing. He is giving it his all in this episode. And this really does feel like there is no hope that they are literally fighting a losing battle. John Sim. As the master, he is fantastic. I like how he is less erratic than he was during the Davies era. If anything, he is a more calm and collected master, but also never been more evil 
Um, he really is a despicable character in this episode. And I love his interactions with Missy. Um, John Sim and Michelle Gomez obviously work very well together and they bring those characters to life in a great way. And um, obviously Missy's story arc goes full circle in this episode because she eventually decides that she's going to work with the Doctor even if it's a losing battle, she has to stand with her friend, so kills her former self. And eventually the, the master ends up killing Missy as well, which, you know, both masters stabbing each other in the back. That is exactly what they would do to one another. So I, that aspect of the episode was done very well. Missy's free series story arc, and especially her story arc in series 10 about her becoming a good person, goes full circle because in the end she does become a good person, it's just too late and the Doctor will obviously never know that Missy decided to change her allegiances. Apart from the master aspect of this episode, this episode is primarily focused on the relationship between the Doctor and Bill. Obviously Bill having been converted into a Mondasian Cyberman, and the Doctor trying to get her to come to terms with what has happened. And it's done really well. I mean, there are some heartbreaking moments which will bring tears to your eyes, especially conversations where the Doctor has to explain to Bill that this is it for her. He can't do anything to save her. So they're truly emotional moments. I like Nardole in this episode. Nardole once again goes full circle from his first appearance in The Husbands of River Song being this very comedic character now to now being this commanding character who's actually taking charge of the situation and uh, prepared to put his life on the line in order to save everyone else. So Nardole, once again, a character who did his full circle. The entire idea of this episode being set around a small farm where there are loads of children on and the Doctor having to basically fend off Cybermen. It's just something which works very well. The stakes feel very high because obviously you've got children on this farm, so you need to protect them at all costs. And then the last 15 minutes of this episode are some of the best I've ever seen in Doctor Who. When you've got the 12th Doctor blowing up Cybermen left, right and centre, listing all the times he has defeated them. I mean, what is more epic than that? And the way... The Doctor is killed in this episode is brutal. I mean, he gets killed. I mean, after the third time he gets zapped by that Cyberman and you just see the Doctor literally fall to the ground in excruciating pain. It is, it is, it's hard to watch. It really is hard to watch. Plus, I think it's interesting how the Doctor had planned not to regenerate. He blew up all the Cybermen and that costed, cost him his regeneration. And if anything, he's quite happy to die. So I, I, think, I think that was more heartbreaking than anything else. The Doctor was willing to give up. He was just happy he was going to have some peace and quiet and could die in peace. And then obviously Bill gets saved by Heather, the pilot from the first episode. And this has always been, for me, the hardest part of this episode to accept because I felt it undermined Bill's transformation into a, the Mondasian Cyberman. But having rewatched it in preparation for this review, I actually think her story goes full circle as well. Because obviously Heather was the reason that she found out about the Doctor and the TARDIS and time and space. So the end of her story being finally being able to go with Heather is an interesting way route to go down and it does bring her story full circle plus i love bill's final goodbye to the doctor in his tardis it is it is once again so emotional stephen moffat did a fantastic job with the script for this episode all these heartbreaking and emotional moments and i've part of me wishes it would have ended there so if anyone doesn't know the doctor falls was actually supposed to be Capaldi's final episode as the Doctor and I think it would have worked very very well but because Chris Chibnall who took over from Moffat as showrunner didn't want to do a Christmas special Moffat decided to extend um, Capaldi's era until the following Christmas special and I've always felt that that was disappointing because I think the Doctor Falls would have been a beautiful farewell for the 12th Doctor. Not that that takes away any aspect of the episode, it's still a fantastic series finale, probably one of the best in modern Who. And now we end with the final Christmas special, or at least until 2023, Twice Upon a Time. 
Now, Twice Upon a Time is the Twelfth Doctor's regeneration story. And it's a very different kind of regeneration story compared to what we've been used to seeing in uh, modern Doctor Who. You know, we're used to regeneration story being quite action-packed, being the last hurrah of the Doctor. And Twice Upon a Time is very different to that. Firstly, the elephant in the room, we see the return of the first Doctor, this time portrayed by David Bradley. And I like... Uh, David Bradley's performance, yes, the first Doctor is depicted as very sexist, and I don't know how I feel about that. I think one joke would have been alright, but, but to have it as a continuous theme of the episode, I feel like that was a mistake. But, all in all, the first Doctor is great in this episode. I like how the first Doctor is obviously very nervous because it's his first regeneration, and the twelfth Doctor is just... He's so against regeneration. He's he's against it. He's cynical. He doesn't want the Doctor to go on because he's just tired of changing all the time. And I think it's very interesting. We've never seen a Doctor like this before. Because let's face it, the Doctor is the same person. He just regenerates. He's renewed every every time he is killed. And at not one point he's thought, you know what, I'm tired of constantly being someone else. You know, I just want to die as I am and that's interesting I think they do an interesting job because it's not like the 10th Doctor where the 10th Doctor was obviously so in love with his current form he didn't want to change with the 12th Doctor it's more about he just doesn't want to go on he can't cope with the constant loss and change which he has to go through so he just wants to end it so this episode is very much about the Doctor being persuaded that he needs to regenerate again now, Twice Upon a Time, the plot is pretty standard. Um, it turns, it's, it involves this World War I soldier, portrayed very well by Mark Gatiss, being taken out of time uh, just before he dies, because there is this alien spacecraft which takes people out of time just before they die and kind of records their memories and their last moments and then sends them back to die, and the machine malfunctions. So it's, it's very much one of those, there's not actually a threat to this episode, it's more just a machine which malfunctioned, which is an interesting thing to do, that there's no big threat for a Doctor's final adventure. Obviously through this thing we see the return of Bill, because Bill's memories were recorded just before she died. So it's interesting to see the Doctor have to work with this kind of mirror version of Bill. It's not actually Bill, but it has all of Bill's memories, characteristics and personality, so it's kind of like Bill. So I think it, it works. It doesn't undermine Bill's departure at the end of The Doctor Falls. Now for me, Twice Upon a Time, there is nothing wrong with Twice Upon a Time. I think it's an enjoyable watch. The last 15 minutes really do raise it to high quality standard. Uh, with the Christmas armistice being held, and that's the reason the World War One soldier isn't actually killed, because they hold the Christmas armistice just before he was about to be shot. I think that's interesting. It's great to see that history being portrayed on screen, because it is that time when warring nations put their differences aside just for one day because it was Christmas. And I think it works in this Doctor Who Christmas special. I like how both the first Doctor and the twelfth Doctor come to the decision that they must regenerate. And I love the twelfth Doctor's goodbye. Um, you know, from him hugging his companions to getting his memories back so that he remembers Clara. It's all those things which make Doctor Who so special. And I love his final speech. Peter Capaldi is the master of monologues and his final monologue, it's great. Because this isn't the Twelfth Doctor speaking. This is Peter Capaldi. This is a lifelong fan who got the opportunity of a lifetime, his dream role. And now he's got to let it go. And I think his final words are great when he just says, Doctor, I let you go. That's not the Twelfth Doctor, that is Peter Capaldi leaving the role. So... The Twelfth Doctor's departure is something very special. His regeneration scenes, the more I see them, the more I find them emotional. Twice Upon a Time is a decent Christmas episode. I think it's a fond farewell to the Twelfth Doctor. And I think that, by and large, while I think the Doctor Falls would have been the better way for the Twelfth Doctor to depart... 
I'm not going to complain about Twice Upon a Time because it is a beautiful Christmas story. So in conclusion, if I could sum up series 10 in one word, it would be beautiful. I adore series 10. I think it's a very underrated series. I think a lot of people write it off because it's Stephen Moffat's final series as showrunner. So by this point, a lot of people were just sick of Moffat and wanted him gone. But you know what? Series 10, it was a breath of fresh air. It takes things back to basics. It focuses on compelling character stories as well as interesting and unique episode concepts. Peter Capaldi as the 12th Doctor, I adore in this series. He's a good mould of Series 8 and Series 9 Doctors. And there is so much material for Capaldi to get his teeth into that he really gets to show how incredible of an actor and an incarnation of the Doctor he is. Pearl Mackey as Bill Potts was a breath of fresh air. I love her friendship with the 12th Doctor. They both work so well together. And it's probably one of my favourite Doctor and Companion teams. I also love Nardole as well. His inclusion into that uh, dynamic in the end, which creates a solid three-person unit between the Doctor, Bill and Nardole, which works very well. Now, in terms of story arc, Series 10 focuses primarily on the concepts of forgiveness. You know, with Missy having to try and seek the Doctor's forgiveness and redeem herself. It's very interesting and Michelle Gomez does a fantastic job with the, her portrayal of Missy showing a very different side to the character and a character who has experienced a lot of growth since her first appearance in Series 8. Now, does Series 8 have good episodes? Yes. Um, I love the majority of these episodes. And even lesser ones, such as The Empress of Mars or The Eaters of Light, I can still watch and enjoy, even if they're not the best. While other episodes in this series are amazing, Oxygen, World Enough and Time, The Doctor Falls, they're fantastic, and I'd be hard-pressed to find faults with them. And then you've got fun episodes like The Pilot, Smile, Thin Ice. You know, th th there is something for everyone in Series 10. If you're new to Doctor Who, this is a great opportunity to jump onto it. Because Series 10 is a very good introductory series. Even though it's a Doctor's final series, it's surprisingly a great introductory series. And that is why Series 10 gets a well-deserved gold ranking. Now... Series 10, it's underrated. I, I can't stress it enough. It's such an underrated series. So I would say for those of you out there who kind of just write it off because it's a later Moffat series, just don't. Watch it and appreciate it for the fantastic series of Doctor Who. It well and truly is. So thanks for watching guys, I really do hope you enjoyed this video. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe in order to receive great and maybe even improved quality content in the future. Now, I finished series 10, which was a beautiful departure for Peter Capaldi as the 12th Doctor. And now we move on to a new era. The Chris Chibnall era. Now this was supposed to be a brand new era, which was going to breathe new life into Doctor Who because it's fair to say series 10 while I think it was a very strong series viewing figures were pretty hit and miss for it. Would Chris Chibnall and his new lead Jodie Whittaker as the 13th Doctor be able to pull it off? Well you'll have to watch my review in order to get my opinion of it so thanks for watching and I will see you in another one. See ya!